Stephen, Mr. SOS. Thanks so much for coming on the Vantage Point podcast. Uh, first of all, how are you today? I'm doing very well. I'm doing very, very well. The sun is shining. Life's good. I can't complain. Yeah, it's good weather here as well in Wales. Are you in London? Are you uh, no, I'm actually I'm near Manchester right now. You're a man of many talents. You know, I've been looking through your socials and you know, I'd like to I'd like you to put it in your own words. How do you explain what you do in the most simplest terms? I try to be the symbol of anything is possible. So what what that means is, for example, I'm in business. I started my digital marketing agency six years ago. And through the ups and downs of being a business owner, we're doing well, we're growing, and well, we're still in business. And I don't know what statistics you know about business. Most businesses are past the first three to five years or something like that. So achieving that major milestone is good. And now it's a case of what's the next level and how do we take that further? So that, that's one thing. Uh, I played a lot of football. I got injured. I've actually had four operations and I'm still you know, fit enough shape. I came back from all of them where I'm still able to play at a pretty decent level. So trying to be the symbol of anything is possible would probably be the easiest way I can summarize what I'm about and just don't take no for an answer. Whatever the obstacle is, there's always another solution, even if it looks like there isn't. So I guess I'm just trying to embody that in the full sense of the phrase. Yeah, yeah, I certainly get that impression. You know, when I when I look through some of your videos, um, you have a very positive sort of mental outlook, and I think you have to have that as well because you're um you you title yourself as an angel investor. That's someone who essentially invests in small businesses, right? Who um, I, I suppose you have to be quite careful in where you select to invest your money um what, what do you think the the importance is of backing um a small business that could potentially go far but but could potentially have a big risk of losing you money what why even go in that field that's a that's a great question so the angel investment side of things is the newest string to my bow like i said i've been in business for the last sort of six years and i actually started in business about 14 years ago without realizing what what i was doing so the importance of backing that is you look at any economy on mainstream media, you hear the, oh, this company just IPO'd or this company just had a unicorn valuation, so on, so on, so on. So when you look at any first world economy, what drives the economy, what runs the economy are the small, medium enterprises that make that work. So without small businesses, there won't be any economy. Yes, it's nice to talk about the large ones and everyone has the aspiration to get them, but without the small businesses, which is the bedrock of most functioning economy, it's impossible. Therefore, for me, I'm looking at businesses that are trying to do something, businesses that are trying to make a change. That doesn't mean they're a one of a kind and no one's doing what they're doing because I'm in digital marketing. Like anyone can start a digital marketing agency, but the way we do it, the value proposition that we do has helped us be successful. So you can still do things someone's doing, but you can do it in a better way. Can you do it in a more positive way? Can you do it in a more streamlined way, for example? So for me, I'm trying to, to back other small businesses who, when I started, I didn't have that kind of backing. I had to figure everything out myself. I'm still figuring out everything myself in this next chapter that I'm in. So if I can share some of those advices or some of those, I guess, stories of things that I've been through to then guide those small businesses along the right path, then so be it. So it's not just about the, the money side of things. It's, it's more. Like you're saying there, you're providing value as well as uh, just the money side of things. It, it's your 10 plus years or so in business that's let you get, get the experience in this. And, um, you know, I, I was wondering, you know, it, it took me, what, a day for, for me and you to connect and get this set up. That's probably the fastest I've ever set up a podcast with someone. And I wonder, is that because um, in order for you to have had the success you've had, you've had to take a lot of risks and just sort of seize opportunity where you see it? Do you think that's important for someone who owns a small business to to try and embody that kind of mindset? It's super important. I mean, one of the things I see and hear from a lot of small business owners is, oh, the big corporates are doing this. The big corporates have the resources to do this. And so but what small business owners forget is they're not as nimble as you are. 
when you're small, you've got pace, you've got speed, you've got flexibility, you've got adaptability. When you're big, you got to go through compliance. they got to go through that ladder. They have to approve it. Then they have to approve it. And for good reasons, by the yeah. way, because that's how you remain big. But when you're small, you've yeah. got that dynamism about you that most big businesses still wish they have. So for me, being able to get something set up very quickly is important. When you can leverage technology, when you can, when you don't have that, when you can remove the fear factor of, or what if they say no, or what what if it doesn't work out? Listen, so many things aren't going to work out. One of the one of the wisest statements that I've heard recently was: most people think to be successful, you just got to be successful. Well, you actually have to fail a lot to be successful, and the the size of your failures often directly correlates to the impact of the success that you can have. So like you said, we were able to set this thing up in 24 hours or, or whatever whatever it was. I saw your yeah. stuff. I thought, this guy's doing something cool. Can I add value? Can I jump on board? I DM'd you on Instagram or I think I left a comment on one of your posts and yeah, you, yeah. you came right back, sent you my calendar link. We were able to book something. That's, you know, and here we are talking, talking about it today for, as a small business, if you can prioritize speed, because some people think you got to get everything perfect. Your level of perfection is still not going to be, there's still room for improvement as time comes, as technology advances. So what you think is perfect, it's never really yeah. perfect. Just get on with it. Learn as you go. That doesn't mean you be complacent and deliver below quality stuff. It's still got to be a certain standard. But ultimately, when you're small, speed is, speed is priority. Yeah, you have to get um what you can out um while maintaining a certain level of quality, but without spending too long um and ah and about is this the perfect version of what I'm going to put out, or is this um you know just a version of what I'm going to put out that's going to be better and better each time, you know, and uh, finding that balance is sort of just learning from your mistakes, like you were saying there, you know, I think I think you absolutely hit the nails on, on the head when you said you have to fail a bunch of times in order to actually be good at something, um, and I think a lot of people are just scared to fail. Now, um, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. Um, I've watched a lot of really sort of horrifying and painful pitches on Shark Tank and Dragon's Den shows like this. Really horrible pitches where they just they crumble under the pressure. They can't get the dragons or the sharks on side. Uh, Now, now if, if say, an investor, sorry, no, a small business was coming to you um, looking for your investment um, or to to anyone who's looking, who has an idea, and they want to pitch their idea to an investor, how would you go about it? What would your advice be to someone who's trying to get someone on side? Wow, that's a good question. And the first thing I'm looking for is I'm looking, I'm looking in their eyes. I'm trying to find that passion because ideas are a dime a dozen. Execution is what really matters. You can't fake passion. Like you can you can fake interest to some degree. But when you look, look deeply into someone's eyes, you can't fake passion. You know whether someone got it or they're full of, uh, uh, like they're full of crap, basically. And that's the first thing you can ask. So the first thing is, don't take it to anyone if you don't believe in it. That's number one. Then the second thing is, I'm looking at what experience do they have? That doesn't mean they've run a business before or they've been successful. Because like I said, I started from, from nowhere. But I'm looking in the sense of, have they got skin in the game? Meaning, what have they sacrificed to start this thing going? Are they involved? Are they as indulged in the game or as they want me to be to part away with whether it's my money or my time or whatever it is? What have they sacrificed for the business? And can I see it going somewhere? So if I see the passion and then I see the, the effort which I titled or called experience. Then I'm looking at the next layer on is, okay, how savvy are they? How smart are they? Can they communicate? Can they sell? Are they a numbers person? Are they analytical? Are they more on the creative side of things? What are they going to bring to the table in the industry? Exactly. What are their strengths that I can then weigh up and go, you know what? It's worth taking a risk because life is a risk either way. I think you might have heard of this story if you follow Gary Vee. I think it's one of his major failures or something. He bangs on about it all the time on how um, was he 
was it Uber that he passed on or was it Facebook that he passed on? He passed on one of the major companies that came to him. And yeah, if he had just yeah. if he had just wrote a check for 25 grand, someone like Gary Vee, 25 grand is probably not a large sum of money. It could have turned him into billions and billions and billions. So life is a risk. He could have risked the money into another startup, which most investors don't tell you about. It's, it's not everything you invest in that always strike gold either. So you could invest in and not go anywhere but you get a lot of lessons from it. And then you could invest in something that could have gone somewhere. And because you decide to not take the risk, it doesn't go anywhere. So either way, life is a risk. It's a case of which risk are you willing to take? You said you come from nothing. Um, you grew up in Nigeria, right? Yep. How hard was it to build your brand? And what struggles did you face trying to appeal to a UK audience and Obviously, you've made it very successful here in, in the UK. I've seen, um, you know, your posts with Piers Morgan and a ton of other like big celebrities, and I'm like, whoa, okay, this is <laughs> this guy. This guy's really like taken taken this somewhere, and uh, you, you've been making connections. How hard was it to get to where you are now? It is difficult business, but like I said to you, when you ask me what I'm looking for, I'm looking for passion because you can't fake passion. When you have passion, it becomes slightly easier. Emphasis on the word slightly easier. You still got to work hard at it, but because you're super passionate, you're engrossed in it, you don't look at the monumental challenge that you got to overcome to get where you're looking to get to. So, some of the things that was quite challenging for me. So, I came to England when I was 14. I was very fortunate. I came to England at the age of 14. So, you can say still formative years, which means if you're an adaptive person, you can you can adapt relatively comfortably at that age, which I did. I watch a lot of films. I watch a lot of shows and things like that because for me, I always want to understand the culture. Can I know? I'm a, I'm a sponge. I'm like I like to learn. What can I learn about what I mean, the culture I mean, the way people work, the way people relate that I can understand to then utilize to to my advantage. So when I eventually started the business, officially launched and registered a company limited entity when I was 24 years old, back in 2017, I went out networking. I said I came from nothing. I didn't have any reason. Like, I'm not joking. I started the company with £100. How do you start a company with £100? I bought a domain name for £15. I went on Vistaprint. I don't know if you remember Vistaprint, if they're still going or not. Yeah, I bought yeah. some business cards for £50. And then, you know, you need some emergency funds, right? So the £35 was my emergency funds and off I went. And I just started networking. I started going to conferences. I started going to events, workshops, building relationships. I want to connect with people because I realized very quickly, if I'm going to be successful and I don't know anyone, I've got to be known. That's part of why we're connected here. Because like I said, as I get to the next level of where I'm trying to go, now I need a more digital connection. Hence why, why, we're, why we're doing this. But from the offline standpoint, I study people. What's the mannerism? How do that stranger just walks into a room not knowing that person? All of a sudden, they're connected. They're talking about something. What's the trick? What's the tip? And fundamentally, I had to overcome that fear of the unknown and just went ahead and do it. So then I started building my network up. And now I'm able to connect people together because I now have a stronger network. And I don't, I don't know what famous person said it, but he said, your, your net worth is your network. And that statement is super true because the more quality people you need, who you know, the access you get to certain things. So the, the overall difficult thing for me, I guess, was not knowing what I didn't know. But as soon as I figured it out, I started learning and went deeper and fundamentally implemented it. So that would be how I've managed to keep doing what I'm doing, which, by the way, that game never stops. I'm just trying to play now at the next level. But it, it is the exact same thing. You know, I've seen that you've done a hell of a lot of videos. Um, I saw on your website, you said you've done over 500 videos um, posted across your social media. Um, how, how do you use SEO techniques to boost your videos or potentially reach a wider audience? Very good question. So. SEO in its most simplest form is somebody that don't know about you going on a particular platform, most of the time Google, to do a search for what they're looking for. 
what you do happens to be what they're looking for, but they don't know you. So SEO is the process of you getting as high as you possibly can on Google, typically the first, second or third position for what it is that you do that the stranger is looking for. Someone don't know you, but they know what they need. They then go on the platform, Google, put a search in, and you come up. When you come up, your website is search engine optimal. The same thing goes for video. So take YouTube, for example. That's the platform. It's a search platform that most people don't realize. Everyone understands that Google is a search engine. So all of these other platforms, they're all search engines in their right. So someone's yeah. going to be looking for something. But on social, people typically know who they're looking for, so they search via the name. However, there are times where people don't know who they're looking for, but they know the type of content they're looking for. So you take, for example, cat video. You type in YouTube, I'm looking for a cat video, a funny cat video. The Did people that come up, <laughs> the people that come <laughs> up, they've optimized that video for funny cat video. The content screams, mm -hmm. the title screams that, the description screams that. That's what search engine optimization is. So as an, as an agency, we focus more on the business website that we do on the video. But I, I, I love doing a video. And that's why I've done so many videos over social media where it's for me, how can I add value maybe to educate people or give people the right tips and tricks so that they can implement themselves whenever they can't afford a big agency. Yeah, and it's putting a face to the uh, to the name and to the brand, isn't it? As well, you know, if people feel like they can get to know you through a video you post, then it makes people trust what you're doing a lot more. You know, um, you know, when you commented on my post saying, uh, you know, talking about potentially making a podcast together, the first thing I did was was check your page out, watch a few videos of yours, and realize, oh, actually, this guy knows what he's talking about. <laughs> I'd like to have him on. But if you hadn't had those videos, I've, I would have a bit been a bit more hesitant to work with you because I don't know I don't know what I'm getting. If you see what I mean, and I think that that applies to all sorts of different businesses. You know, specifically on on YouTube. Then, how do you find SEO is different to other websites, and and how would you make titles more clickable? YouTube is a beast. YouTube is is a is a beast. That's yeah, huge, and there, there's no denying that. And there are certain techniques that are different, but the fundamental principles are the same. These platforms job, they just want to provide the best solution to their customers. They have many customers. So YouTube has a couple of customers. The creator is a customer. The consumer is a customer. But if you look at it from the consumer standpoint, they're looking for the best possible solution in relation to their search. So your job as a creator, you've got to convince the platform, YouTube in this example, that you are able to deliver the best possible solution in relation to that search. How do you do that? You do that through reputation and relevance. So relevant, the content in line with the search, how relevant is it? What's your video in line with? What's the caption talking about? What's the description, your title that you put on? How relevant is it to what that person searched for? Then you look at reputation. This is where things like the number of subscribers you have come into play. This is where things like how, how many people are viewing it and how long are they lasting. These algorithms and uh, platforms are very sophisticated to track all of these type of things. Then they put it in some sort of matrix to then say, you know what, in relation to that search, you deserve to come up and you don't because of those kind of scoring perspectives. That's why you see when you grow a platform, once you hit a certain scale, your growth becomes exponential because you've now got reputation. When you're new, it's super difficult. That's where things like collaboration comes in, for example, getting people to link to you to say you're actually credible and give you that shout out and so on and so forth. But over time, as long as you can convince YouTube that you are the most relevant and the most reputable in relation to that particular search, then you start to climb. You see tactics and tricks like using clickbait titles, 
do I recommend clickbait titles? I mean, yes and no. It depends how you use it. That it's a double-edged sword because yes, you want to get people on to click on you, but what happens after that click? Because that the real algorithm. That's why it's monitoring. If someone clicks on you and jumps away after three to five seconds, all of a sudden YouTube now knows that in relation to that search, you're not relevant. You're yeah. not reputable. So it, it's a you've got to use it in a in a strategic way. If your content is relating to that type, then yes, absolutely. And as long as you can engage the audience, you can captivate their attention, then naturally you're going to see you start performing a lot better. Do you think it's more important to produce genuinely fun, engaging, informative content rather than, you know, like you're saying about clickbait, then you see a lot of people trying to um, potentially please the algorithm more so than uh, actually make engaging, creatively genuine videos and again you can see this across all sorts of social media the amount of times i'll click on a video thinking oh this looks like something i'd like but then it ends up being something almost totally different to the title and the thumbnail uh, do you think a lot of people trying to make it as a sort of business or trying to see the money side of it are losing their creativity in the in the process of trying to chase the algorithm i agree 100 percent. i agree but what people don't realize is the algorithm's job is to deliver what people want to see. Ultimately, whether it's you're following the trend, it's because people want to see it. And as soon as people no longer want to see it, they stop. So my advice to anyone doing content and creating content is only create content that you enjoy creating. So I did a video on YouTube every week for four years straight. I stopped when I couldn't wow. do it anymore and the business took off in the sense that I didn't have the time. Those videos, by the way, they are not optimized. Like, I think the best video maybe has 50 views. No one's seen them. But I did it for four years straight. You know why? Because I enjoyed doing them. And could I have, if I had optimized them? Oh, absolutely. I could have blown up with what I know now. But the reality is back then, I just wanted, like you said, the reason it made it so easy for us to connect is you saw the content when you eventually, when you looked at it, you saw it and you were in, intrigued enough to have a conversation. That's part of why I've been able to grow my business. So when, when I say that to people in this modern age, no views, why did you do it? You should have stopped. I didn't stop because I enjoyed it. But here's the flip side of it. Those videos that I did single-handedly has brought me contracts worth over a quarter of a million pounds. Let me explain why. Wow. We, had, we, had a, we had a project that came through and they were looking for a creative agency to handle the website, create a bunch of content, video-based content, audio-based content, and a lot of written content. But as part of the proposal, they needed demonstrable evidence that you've done it. Their audience was for businesses, small businesses. Well, guess what I've been doing for the last four years? Creating content or small businesses, even though it never went viral, it never took off, it never had the kind of views that people are looking for. But because I was so passionate about it, I loved doing it. I was I able to that. just evidence it. And they saw all the videos galore, different topics for business, marketing, sales, web development, so on and so forth. They saw the audio version on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and so on. They saw written pieces on our blogs that were dedicated. And like I said, he was able to help me win a good contract. Now, as things progress, yes, you've got to be smart with the algorithm and you've got to know what's going on. But fundamentally, if you're creating content that you enjoy, content that you're passionate about, and the content is bringing value to a group of people, whether it's huge group or medium-sized group or small group of people, you're ultimately going to be successful. Yes, you need to tweak things like, does my thumbnail need to look a certain way to get people, my click-through rate to be increased or not? But if the content is fundamentally something you're passionate about, it will shine through. When it's something to just gimmick the algorithm or a fad, for example, to try and jump on a trend, it's going to scream loudly in your delivery of the content and fundamentally yeah. never be as successful as you can be over a long, long period of time. I've seen you talk in some of your videos about uh, the rise of AI and, uh, you know, which is 
I mean, I'm sure everyone knows, but artificial intelligence. And I wondered if you'd seen the Elon Musk interviews about about AI, where he talks about uh, us needing regulation for that sort of thing and, and uh, potentially the dangers of it. Have you heard much about that? Yeah, I've seen some stuff. It's it's a space I'm, I'm playing in. I've actually got a, a startup that I've not launched yet doing some pretty cool stuff with artificial intelligence. It's something I'm I'm extremely, extremely passionate about. And the, the notion of it is to help people be smarter with AI. So when uh, when they eventually release, I'm building the, the MVP at the moment. And when we launch that, we're, we're going to be able to get some users on board for beta testing. And I can I can bring that to you for, for you to see your thoughts. But in terms of artificial okay. intelligence as a whole, oh, it, it's game changer. It's like, it's almost like going back to 1998 for anyone who's old enough, I guess, 2000, when internet took off. You heard of the dot-com bubble or maybe even closer it's almost like understanding blockchain to some degree in the landscape of it so blockchain was the fundamental technology which crypto then came off the back of nfts came off the back of and so many other kind of offshoots DeFi, and, and all these other crazy stuff that came off the back of that but blockchain is the fundamental technology artificial intelligence is a similar kind of thing so Think of internet. With internet, you could then do e-commerce. With internet, you could then do social media. Internet was the underlying infrastructure. That's what artificial intelligence is. And then you look at things like chat GPT. That's an NPL, neural programming language, which is an offshoot of artificial intelligence. You look at robotics connected to artificial intelligence. That's another offshoot. So AI is the fundamental underlying kind of infrastructure and technology which you can then do so many different things with so is right absolutely because one thing we're good at as humans is ruining things very freaking quickly because we don't know yes. it we push it to the extreme and it's always the handful or the smaller percentage of the negative folks that then completely ruins it you look at social media social media is a brilliant tool it's a way for you to connect with people who you don't know or you might know but you're in distant location and so on and so forth. That's amazing. But you look at what social media is today, especially Instagram. It's a way to keep up with the Joneses. It's a way to wreck your emotional stability and your mindset and so on, thinking you're, you're, you're so far away from where other people are. It's always the smaller population of the negative users that then overshadow the great things that the technology can achieve. That's why people like Elon Musk is saying what he's saying, because it's true. If there's no sort of governance around it, and it's the wild, wild west, the free-for-all, people will misuse the technology as a whole. But AI is here to stay, and it's going to add so much value as long as people can start learning the capabilities of it. Yeah, I think so as well. Um, but I wonder if you, if you give any merit to his his other theories about ai where there's a potential danger of it where i mean as to, to quote him roughly he says how do you deal with ai when it reaches the point as you know technology like i say has increased so much in the last 20 years you know when you talk about from the internet to cryptocurrencies and then now to ai it makes you wonder what happens when the ai becomes more intelligent than the smartest person on the planet how do you then govern it because you can't outthink it <laughs> what do you do do we need to install an off switch and if we install an off switch what's to stop you know other countries potentially russia china places where that they might use it to a, to a much greater extent than the western countries what's to stop them getting ahead of us if we're sort of being overly careful with it i'm not a doomsday kind of guy like you mentioned earlier I'm, i look on the on the positive side of things the reason oh, that's good that's good <laughs> the, the, the reason uh someone like elon musk gets quoted a lot about that type of thing is because he's a public facing guy he's not the only one saying this stuff by the way there's a book i was reading in three months ago that was talking along the same lines is like ai think about it it's a technology that we train right for the most part in, in a simplistic way to explain it we feed it some data it then goes off and does stop off it. Now, if it's being fed 
good data, meaning it's not for malicious reasons. It's data that's going to add value to humanity as a whole. Then we've got nothing to worry about. But like I just said in my previous answers, it's that small percentage of people with ulterior motives that then feeds it all the other non-valuable, non-kind of, I guess, the the moral information that's not good for humankind that's going to cause the problem. So that's where things like governance and things comes into play because as long as we can maintain the knowledge base that's feeding into this artificial intelligence, it's only going to be a net, net positive. Now, what's going to happen in terms of the doomsday scenario like he was talking about? I don't know. I hope I'm old enough and uh, I've reached 100 years and died before I find that out. But it, it, it is a potential it is a potential problem. But think about it. Everything is a problem till there's a solution, right? You look at internet. When internet first started, it's like, what? Well, especially credit card payment processing. What? Well, you're going to put your card on a piece of web page, your card information, and give your money away? Are you crazy? Blah, blah, blah. But what do we do? We don't even put our card. We say, Apple, I, uh, I pay, pay Google Pay wallet or Apple kind of wallet, whatever you use. It's like, here's my card information. As soon as I tap my phone, just take my money. It's ludicrous. We will always find a way because as humans, we always, always adapt and we always, always find a solution. But the goal is hopefully it doesn't get to that kind of iRobot-esque scenario where we're then having to fight the robots because I'm not sure we've got a good chance there. Yeah, I think we're done in if that happens. <laughs> but um, you know, as with everything, we're we're the um orchestrators of our own downfall. But um exactly. you'd like to think that that people will overall on average use these amazing technologies for good rather than for not so good purposes. Now you you're we very well so. read on 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 all this stuff, right? And uh I've seen you you go to the gym, you look after your health, and you also I read on your website as well. You spend ten hours. A, I can't remember if it was ten hours a day or ten. I must have been ten hours a week, right? A week, um, yeah. Learning things. Learn. Yeah, yeah, it must be a week. Yeah, it's a week. <laughs> I was thinking. And ten hours a day is a bit mental. But um, yeah, if you're spending ten hours a day learning things, um, I've got two questions for you. First of all, how important do you think it is that we train our brains in that way, make an effort to go out and learn stuff, as well as looking after our bodies and the way we we work out and things like that in a holistic sense? And also, following that, what's the most recent thing you've learned? Um, yeah, so it's, it's about roughly about 10 hours a week, uh, typically about an hour and a half a day I spend learning or it, not necessarily every day. Sometimes it might be I'm spending four hours just to learn in one day and then I skip a couple of other days. But I try to read at least one book a week and I watch a lot of content online. I mean, 90% of everything I know, even though I've got a first degree in computing web development, come from self-learning and platforms like social media and YouTube, believe it or not. So I, I try to feed my, my mind that way. And yeah, you got to work out because we now live a lot longer than we used to, right? Think about it. If someone said, you've probably seen this on Instagram, there's, there's tons of it. I'll give you a million quid, but you're not going to wake up tomorrow. What, what's, what good is that million pound, right? We're all chasing the financial status, but which then tells you health is obviously straight away more important than wealth. Okay, we'll flip it a different way. I'll give you a million pound, but you're not going to die. You're going to be okay. But mentally, you're going to be incapacitated, right? You're not going to choose that, are you? So you need to then feed your brain as well as you're feeding your body and you're eating the right stuff. So body, soul, and spirit type conversation to then help you achieve a lot further on in your financial aspiration. So it's, it's crucial, super, super important. Now, I'm not perfect. I do miss days and, and stuff like that, but you always try not to go too long before you recover because then it turns into a habit so ever since i've been 16 years old i've been going to the gym and on average i go to the gym maybe three to four times a week on average there are times where i've not gone for three months because i've got stuff that are going on i'm not perfect i'm a human being but then you get back on it and once you form that habit it's ultimately gonna, gonna benefit you and the second part of that question what's the most recent thing oh, yeah. thing that you've learned 
I'll share a finance one, actually, because I was talking okay. to somebody earlier about this. So people look at investing in a very dynamic way of, I got to buy that stock. And then once it goes here, I got to sell that stock. And then I got to put it into this and then I flip it into this and flip it into that. Statistically speaking, this is numbers. This is logic. You can't argue with numbers and facts. Statistically speaking, if you want to make more money on your uh, investment, stick it in an index fund and leave it there. Don't touch it. Because people actually lose a lot of money on the fees that they yeah. pay when you sell a stock. And well, maybe if you're using a financial advisor, for example, they might charge 1% or 2% or whatever the percentage fees. But statistically speaking, if you just leave your investment in an index fund, a reputable index fund like an S&P 500 or a FTSE 100, FTSE 250 or stuff like that, you're going to make more than the person who's dynamically trading and trying to trying to time the market and things of that nature. But it's also the most boring approach. That's probably why a lot of people don't do it. But that's that's one of the cool ones that I've learned that I think might add value to, to your audience potentially. Yeah, yeah. I've actually heard that a friend of mine does accounting and um he's recommended the same thing to me. So yeah, yeah, for anyone listening, I think that's something um people should certainly look into if they if they haven't heard of that before. Um anyway, Stephen, uh, this has been an amazing episode. Uh thanks so much for coming on. That's all we've got time for today. We're about to run out of time altogether. Um, yeah, thanks so much, man. Yeah, I appreciate you having me, Glenn. It's it's been a pleasure and I hope whoever's listening or whoever's watching has found it valuable.